Okay. Good morning, brothers and sisters. And I'm sorry for the uh, delay at this point. The adversary apparently does not want this to go out. I'm having internet connection problems. So I'm doing this strictly on the phone with Theodore's assistance so that you have something to see on the screen. So shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance, for his blessing as we join together and look <clears throat> to be enlightened by that which Sister White has written? Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we come before you on the Sabbath with grateful hearts, filled with praise. We thank you for your healing hand that has been upon Theodore and Heidi. We thank you, Father, for the many blessings that you have been providing through this week. There are many tests that have been being given for several throughout the world. We thank you for these tests. We thank you for these challenges because we know then that those that are being tested and challenged are those that are being presented, that they are being seen as sons and daughters of God. We ask, Father, today, as we open your word and that of your prophet, that you may help us to understand what we are seeing before us. Help us to accept these admonitions, to be guided by them, so that your direction may be accepted within our lives. We need you, Father. We also need your spirit. In this presentation, may I be hidden behind you and behind your cross. May it be your character and your character alone, which is represented. Be with us now, be with us each one, so that what is said may fall upon the fertile ground and not upon the rocky ground. May your spirit be with us. May your angels attend us, help us, and guide us now. For this, we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Now, as we have been studying over the last several weeks, in the book of Zephaniah, there have been several things that Mrs. White was bringing forth. The paper that I'm going to be reading from is part of this that, said, that is titled Criticizing Others. And this is tied in with the book of Zephaniah. As we've been seeing, the book of Zephaniah, the book of Joel, the book of Isaiah, the book of Ezekiel, all of these have been written for our admonition. Now we're going to start letter 30, 1888, paragraph 14. One thinks things should be done after his way. Another shouts out his orders to do things after his way. And there is not concerted action. Have we not seen this in the movement over the last several months, over the last several years? Let everyone do his level best to move the load with might and strength. It is the duty of all to do this. Think of an ox cart. Let's say that that cart is being pulled by four oxen and each wants to go in their own way. How well does the load move? Does the cart move at all? How can we expect that the Lord's work is going to be done if all we're going to do is look to move in the way that we each think is best? Who is our captain? Who is our leader? If the Lord should treat us as some that claim to be Christians treat one another, we should have a very sore, hard time. 
if he should look upon the selfish, the erring, or the crooked ones as they look upon one another and deal with one another, what would become of us? Have we been treated as we deserve to be treated? What say you? Well, I'm not sure who who's who's treating us the way we deserve to be treated. God doesn't treat us the way we deserve to be treated, that's for sure. That's my point. Yeah. I mean, he treats but us We are seeing unearned. But we are seeing within the movement treatment by others that is not in God's keeping. Yeah. Well, I think it's really important that we treat others in a redemptive manner. Yes. Agreed. But I am glad the Lord is not man. He bears with our crooked ways, our selfishness, our separation from him, our defects of character, and seeks to inform us, sending message after message of mercy, encouragement, warning, reproof, and correction to bring us into a right position before him that we may have his love, his care, his blessing abiding upon us. Praise God. But if we choose our own selfish, perverse ways, then the Lord, after every means is exhausted, says, let them alone. They are joined to their idols. <coughs> No, we Upon saw this. Whom? We saw this in uh, Jones' presentation that we looked at last night. Yes, dealing with the nation. Right. Yeah. Upon whom was this an admonition originally given? This here in 1888. This admonition from Hosea four. Oh. Oh, well, this was given to um, uh, Israel, to Judah. So saying, let them alone, they are joined to their idols. Um, As to God's people. Exactly. To Ephraim. As you, as you wisely pointed out, to Israel. Is this admonition given currently with the leadership of the corporate church? And can this admonition also apply, unfortunately, within the movement? Is this, the, is this what we want God to say of us? Do each of us wish to have this admonition said by God upon us that we are to be left alone, that we are joined to our idols? I don't think anybody would want that um, declaration. I agree with Theodore. We have oh, good. The reason I leave these these portions open for comment is I want to know how each of you believes. I want to know what your thoughts are as we go through this. We each have a work to do for the master. That doesn't mean that the work is devolves strictly upon a pastor, upon a conference worker. We each, we all have a work to do for the master. Will we do this work? Will we labor with unselfish, self-sacrificing interest to build up his cause, to advance his work? I am determined to do the will of God, to make straight paths for my feet, lest the lame be turned out of the way. There are halting lame ones enough to be stumbled by the unchristian doings of many who named the name of Christ. 
but God forbid that any of those who have had a knowledge of and an experience in the workings of God in his ways should themselves be halting and need to be carried. Let them come up to help. Let them become spiritually strong by doing the will of our Heavenly Father. And then they can help the healing, can help the halting lame ones. But I want to impress upon you that you should hurt not the oil and the wine because some have proved to be more dross than gold. I will not give them up. I will cling to them. And because these are unfaithful to large responsibilities, shall we be a dead weight, a drag on those instrumentalities ordained of God? Those reproved will, some of them, be corrected. Some will not, but will have a spirit of revenge. They will try to injure the work and the workers because their unfaithfulness has been discovered and rightfully reproved and faithfully reproved. There will be those brothers and sisters that do not wish to be corrected. May that not be said of us. There will be those who will accept their misrepresentations, who will drink in of their spirit, who will not only imperil the souls of those whom God has in his mercy sent messages of warning, but by representing them as innocent, abused, mistreated, they will make naught of the counsels of God giving unsanctifying sympathy to those who were wholly undeserving of it, all because they put confidence in erring mortals more than God and the working of his spirit through his appointed agencies who correct wrongs and errors in his people. As we studied several months ago, is there an example from this time period that we can see that would have had this type of an attitude. Did not Uriah Smith take this type of attitude when he proclaimed that when Mrs. White has a public vision, then that is from God, but when she gives her testimonies, she is only giving her opinion. How much did she labor with Brother Smith? How much did she labor also with Dr. Kellogg? They put out their own eyes and cannot discern the workings of the enemy any more than they could discern the workings of the Spirit of God to set things in order. They make impressions upon other minds that have not a knowledge of the real workings of evil or the positive workings of the Spirit of God. Therefore, they call good evil and evil good. Here is she not describing the condition of the fourth generation? Yeah, and there's sort of a a principle here that that underlies what she's saying. And if we are going to discern evil, we first must discern it in ourselves. That's why the Laodicean message, we need that ISAV. That ISAV is so that we can see our own spiritual condition, how far we are from God. And yet the reason why we criticize others is because we don't want to look at our own condition. And by criticizing others, we can feel that we're better than we really are. Because it's easy to see the faults in others. It's not as easy to see the faults in yourselves. You know, um, you know, this message that you're giving and that we've been um, addressing, you know, over the last few years. I find it interesting in and, and I can't say for every person, but I find it interesting that when we speak of righteousness by faith. And, and I know 
uh, Leona definitely understands this principle. But it's not, it's not usually the main point that we look at. We look at, we, we have to overcome sin. That's what righteousness by faith is about, right? Being perfect. Right. Um, but this point is usually not dwelt upon. And it's really one of the most fundamental points of what righteousness by faith, how it comes about. It's by first the conviction of the Spirit of God. And we try to skip this step. We try to make ourselves righteous in our own eyes, which is not righteousness by faith at all. Those that are righteous will not see themselves as righteous. So if you appear righteous in your own eyes, you have strong evidence that you are not righteous. And you need to repent. You need to ask God to give you the eye salve so that you can see your deficiencies. Exactly. Yeah. One of the points is we need this heavenly eye salve. We need to recognize how truly Laodicean we have been. And there are very few of us that want to accept that view. The closer we come to Christ, the more we are given this reflection where we see Christ and we are comparing ourselves with Christ, the more our spirit is being laid in the dust. Too many times we are not humbled. The message of righteousness by faith brings a person to a level where they recognize that humility is what is most necessary because they are not like Christ. And and humility is not not a false humility. No, agreed. It's not, it's not just something we say in front of other people's to look to look humble, like the sports hero who, you know, you know, says, "Oh, I had a good game, but you know, it was really the team that did it." You know, and he's just trying to say that to look humble. Um, right. It has to be true humility, where we really see our deficiencies. And see also how God is working in others. Because when we're truly humble, we see things as God sees things. And we act as God acts. Right. Now this is a condition of things we have had to meet from time to time all through our experience of the last 40 years. She is noting this as being ongoing since the time of the great disappointment here to 1888. And it requires faith and patience to meet all the wily workings of the enemy in all his windings and turnings. But very few can appreciate the difficulties under which a health institute has to labor, especially when there is but little capital. Everyone connected with such an institution needs the preciousness of pure and undefiled religion and the solemn truth of God sanctifying the heart, the life, and the character of the followers of Christ will make men and women discreet, level-headed, to take in the situation of the instrumentalities of God, and they will do their level best to sustain these institutions. <clears throat> there is so little sympathy even among our people, so little true backbone to lift when God would give them lift, 
if all had personal religion, a living faith in Jesus for themselves, then we would see solid, unselfish work done under a pressure of difficulties. My heart is often almost broken with sadness and grief as I see the little real harmony cultivated among believers. We have a solemn work before us. <clears throat> Ye are laborers together with God, and may we work intelligently, heartily, with decision and positiveness that we may be blessed and may bless others. The greatest service we can render to the cause of God and which will reflect steady beams of light onto the pathway of others is to be patient, kind, steadfast as a rock to principle. God-fearing, this will constitute us the salt of the earth, the light of the world. Please note the steps that were given. Patient, kind, steadfast as a rock to principle, and God-fearing. First, second, third, and fourth messages of the angels. We shall be often disappointed, for we shall not find perfection in those who are connected with us, and they will not see perfection in us. It is only by agonizing effort on our part that we shall become unselfish, humble, childlike, and teachable. Meek and lowly of heart, like our divine Lord. We must bring our hearts and minds up to a high point of education on spiritual and heavenly things. This world is not heaven, but it is the workshop of God for the fitting up of his people for a pure and holy paradise. And while each one of us is to feel that he is a part of the great web of humanity, he must not expect that others in that web will be without flaw any more than himself. <clears throat> we do not know the path that our brothers and sisters have had in life. Is it our job to throw stones at them when our own lives have been led in such a way that they have not honored our Lord. Are we not to be patient, uplifting others as we ourselves would want to be uplifted? If this is indeed the workshop of God, consider then how much of the knots, of the imperfections, and the dross that yet needs to be removed from our own lives so that we can then stand as sons and daughters of God. Mistakes will be made, and if the erring are willing to be corrected, a valuable experience is, is gained so that their defeat is turned into victory. You should consider that many of our own errors are not brought to light and be careful not to make the mistakes and imperfections of others appear in their worst light, either to yourself or to others. No man is perfect. An unjust criticism indulged toward others is not wise or Christ-like. All of us must learn, and then, in a Christ-like manner, impart that knowledge to those who really need it. How many of us are to learn? Well, all. Is this something all. that just a few, all, are to learn? I have to learn. You need to learn. We all need to learn. There are many things that you each have yet to teach me. 
I recognize this. I am ready to be taught. How many of us can say that? How many of us are willing to be questioned? How many of us are ready and willing to provide our testimony in showing our true characters before others? Our characters are being worked on by the Spirit in God's workshop. Should we not praise him for that? We have a serious solemn work to do for ourselves to cleanse our own souls from spot and stain if we will stand before the Son of Man when he shall appear, acquitted of him. We must be educators as well as reformers to cut loose from everyone who errs and does not follow our own ideas is not doing as Christ would do for is doing for us. We are all fallible and need pity, forbearance, kindly conversation, and sympathetic love for those with whom we are connected. We are all unworthy of the love and confidence of God. If one errs, then after doing our whole duty to him or for her in a Christ-like manner, we are not to keep the disagreeable and objectionable things before our mind's eye, but to see what is good and praiseworthy in them that we can think of and ponder over and speak of. When there are those within the movement that would seek separation, that would seek to cast others out, that would seek to say what is being presented is wrong, therefore we must toss these people aside. We are not operating in a Christ-like manner. We need to look upon that which is good and praiseworthy. We need this spirit of Christ more than we realize. Yes, we need to look to God. He's the builder of the house. Yes. Let me tell you that there is no work that will tend to the upbuilding of the kingdom of Christ in this world that will not receive the deadly assaults of the enemy. The more the cause of Christ is lifted up, the more the adversary is going to attack. There will be a continual wrestling. Walls of difficulty will arise and objectionable things will appear to discourage those who can be discouraged so that they will not fight on the side of truth, but unite with their forces on the enemy's side to question, to find fault and to let unbelief come in. And then they will be of no help to push when every help is needed at the very time when discouragement is likely to take the place of faith. Brothers and sisters, the cause is before us. How can we be united if we are always finding fault? How can we be united if we are choosing discouragement over faith? How can we be united if we are always saying 
that this person or this person has no right to learn, to question, or to open their mouth. This letter, written as it was in 1888, for those that later attended the general conference session, was falling upon deaf ears. At that time, the message of righteousness by faith was being prepared to be given. The leadership at that time did not wish to have to look at themselves. They felt that they were holy and righteous. They felt, as did Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, that they were completely correct and that the others such as Moses, were being unfair. We need to examine that history. We need to learn more so that we are not repeating those same errors. I'd just like to say that um, when you were saying that last thing there, I immediately went to the story of the fall uh, prior to that, the fall of Satan, I'm talking about. Wasn't that his, his whole argument? Was he, that God was being unfair? Yes. Very just correct. A note, just a note. Our adversary has retained so much of this very, very intelligent mind that he was created with. For over 6,000 years, as men and women, we have lived with the issues that have been brought forth because of the twistings and turnings that that adversary has had and the effect that he has brought upon the human race. If God has dealt with us as we have deserved, we would have been wiped out a long time ago. That's my thought. Okay. Now, As I was led to put this paper together, I look at things chronologically because I like to understand how Mrs. White presented these thoughts and how she would return to them time and time again. The next letter, after letter 30 of 1888, Manuscript 59 from 1890. This was unpublished. Portions of it could be found in Third Selected Messages, page 292. Temperance, page 180 or 169. DTBH. I don't recall what that is. Might be Councils on True Bible Hygiene. This manuscript was entitled Hygienic Reform, Our Present Work. Yeah, so that's uh, Christian Temperance and Bible Hygiene. Okay. Yeah, uh, I believe. So we're okay. going to start with the beginning of the manuscript? We're going to start with the beginning of this manuscript, yes. Okay. We'll see how far we get with it today. Now, the one thing to note... This is another one of these documents that receives a note 
that says one or more typed copies of this document contain additional Ellen White handwritten interlineations, which may be viewed at the main office of the Ellen G. White estate. These other documents with her handwritten interlineations were not presented and published for the public to read. So they remain definitely unpublished. <clears throat> Manuscript 59. Okay, are we ready? Yep, yeah, I have it lined up. Sorry about that. Okay. Let it ever be borne in mind that the great object of hygienic reform is to secure the highest possible development of mind and soul and body. Its aim is not merely physical health, but perfection of the whole being, including holiness of the spirit, a condition which cannot be attained with diseased bodies and diseased minds. <clears throat> All the laws of nature which God has planted in our being are divine and are designed for our good. Excuse me for just a second. Obedience to them is a part of true godliness. It not only promotes health, peace, and happiness, but aids in a preparation for the future life. But to every transgression is a fixed a penalty which must sooner or later be realized. Her statement here carries a lot of weight. For every transgression of the health laws, there is affixed a penalty, which must sooner or later be realized. This is something that if it was to be presented to the brothers and sisters that have chosen to walk in the Omega movement would be hard for them to receive. As we walk today, we must recognize that every choice that we have made that walks contrary to the health laws, those transgressions have a fixed penalty. We have choices to make. When God led the children of Israel out of Egypt, it was his purpose to establish them in the land of Canaan, a pure, happy, healthy, as well as righteous people. Let us look at the means by which he would accomplish this. He subjected them to a course of discipline, which, had it been cheerfully followed, would have resulted in good both to themselves and to their posterity. He removed flesh foods from them in a great measure. He had granted them flesh in answer to their clamors just before reaching Sinai, but it was furnished for only one day. God might have provided flesh as easily as manna, but a restriction was placed upon the people for their good. It was his purpose to supply them with food better suited to their wants than the feverish diet to which many of them had been accustomed in Egypt. The perverted appetite was to be brought into a more healthy state that they might enjoy the food given to Adam and Eve in Eden. Brothers and sisters, as we assemble now, are we praising God for this spiritual food that he has been giving us? 
Many have left and have joined with the Omega. What kind of spiritual food are they partaking of? If we are studying daily, if we are partaking daily of that which God would have us to have in spiritual food, are we not then choosing to be subjected to a course of discipline? Are we then cheerfully following it? God removed from us the errors that have come upon others and have given us the opportunity to join together to study from his word, to learn what true righteousness by faith is about, to examine ourselves so that we might be more prepared to give the trumpet a certain sound. Are we cheerfully following where God is leading. Had they been willing to deny appetite in obedience to his restriction, feebleness and disease would have been unknown among them. Please consider this point for a moment. All of us today have experienced disease. We have been beset by many ailments. We have seen times when we all need and call for prayer of others. Had they been willing to deny appetite in obedience to his restrictions, feebleness and disease would have been unknown among them. Their descendants would have possessed physical and mental strength. They would have had clear perceptions of truth and duty, keen discrimination and sound judgment but they were unwilling to submit to God's requirements and they failed to reach the standard he had set for them and to receive the blessings that might have been theirs. Are we at this time unwilling to submit to God's requirements? Are we today failing to reach the standard that he set for us? If we are, then we are choosing not to receive God's blessings. Do you wish this said of you? They murmured at God's restrictions and lustered after the flesh pots of Egypt. God let them have flesh, but it proved a curse to them. With many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. As Paul wrote this of the, to the Corinthians, he gives an example. of those that refused to receive the blessings that God would have given them. If we are choosing to criticize others, are we not turning our backs on God's blessings? And if we're turning our backs on God's blessings, are we not in fact turning our backs upon God?
remember who who is the accuser of the brethren. Right. But the accuser of the of the brethren, is he able to give us blessings? No, certainly not. We have many things that we need to consider. In examining righteousness by faith, we are given the opportunity to examine ourselves as Christ would see us. How does Christ see us today? How do we stand before Christ? Was Daniel able to stand before Christ when he was presented with this looking glass vision? No. He fell down as one dead. Was Ezekiel able to stand before Christ when he was presented with this vision? Was John the Revelator able to stand before Christ when he was presented with this vision? When Aaron and Miriam stood before Moses with the attitude that they were equivalent to Moses, what did God say to them? Wasn't it somewhat of a rebuke? So it's a definite rebuke. How did God speak to Moses at that time? How did he say he spoke to Moses? Hmm. I speak to Moses face to face, face as to a face. man speaketh with his friend. Yet, what does Mrs. White and Scripture reveal to us about Moses? Was he not the most humble of men? He is the meekest man upon the face of the earth. Yes. Should which, this which not, was not be... Which was not necessarily considered a good thing in in a world right. sense. Yeah. Right. But in the eyes of God, being meek, being humble, being reliant upon our Savior and His strength, is this not what we are called to do? Now, these things are our examples to the intent. Excuse me, I, I jumped too far. They murmured at God's restrictions and lust. Oh, I, did, I did read that, sorry. Now, these things are our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. 1 Corinthians 10, verses 5, 6, and 11. As we approach the close of this earth's history, selfishness, violence, and crime prevail, as in the days of Noah. And the cause is the same. The excessive indulgence of the appetites and the passions a reform in the habit of life is especially needed at this time in order to fit a people for the coming of Christ. The Savior himself warns the church, take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting 
and drunkenness and the cares of this life. And so that that day come upon you unawares. Luke 21, 34. Hygienic reform is a subject that we need to understand in order to be prepared for the events that are close upon us. Can we not also say, not only is hygienic reform a subject that we need to understand, but that righteousness by faith is a subject that we need to understand. Are these not the arms of the gospel? How can we understand righteousness by faith if we are not willing to have the soul temple cleansed of every piece of dross that has been retained. How can we proceed to hygienic reform if we are willing to hold on to the garbage within the soul temple? It is a branch of the Lord's work which has not received the attention it deserves and much has been lost through neglect. It should have a prominent place. It is not a matter to be trifled with, to be passed over as non-essential, or to be treated as a jest. If the church would manifest a greater interest in this reform, their influence for good would be greatly increased. Have we seen the effects of hygienic reform within that of the church? Or have we observed that they have lifted up the mind of man above that of God? Well, you know, I was involved in the health work, and I can say that the simple laws of health that Ellen White gave us uh, to have physical exercise, uh, to not eat flesh meats, uh, to have food that's free from animal, um, animal products, to eat small amounts of food, what's sufficient to eat, two meals a day, um, and to stay away from complicated and exciting foods. Um, all of these things, if a person experiences them, I don't see why they would choose anything else. Yet, you know, we often focus upon the quick fixes, the fad diets, the, the shortcuts to health. These are a complete... Right style the the proper rest and and then a balance of of exercise and rest um you know and of course there are times i've i've not been balanced in my work i've often worked more than i should not get enough rest that's common with me um and i i pay the price for that right so to, to have this, to have these laws of health, I mean, they are such a blessing. And yet we, we make excuses and take shortcuts. And we get involved in things that are just nonsense, as if those things are going to make us healthy. While we neglect the simple laws of health that Ellen White has given us. Uh, that's the thing that I find the most discouraging. Because you can be uh, a vegetarian, but eat extremely unhealthy and be very intemperate in what you watch, what you do, um, in your in your rest. Um, you may not even exercise at all, and yet um, you may feel like you're a health reformer. 
because you don't eat certain things. And you may also even criticize others who don't have some of the same views that you do on, on certain areas. And that's not really helpful at all. In order to be uh, a health reformer, you also need to be an example, not just in, it's not just in words, it's in what you do. Right. Agreed. For those who are looking for the coming of the Lord, for those who are called to be laborers in his vineyard, for all who are fitting themselves for a place in the everlasting kingdom, how important that the brain be clear and the body be as free as possible from disease. The word of God declares the flesh lusteth after the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other. Galatians 5, 17. We are on the battlefield today where the two great forces of vice and virtue are contending for the mastery. The discordant elements of the one and the pure principles of the other are at work, striving for the conquest of every human soul. Satan approaches each one with some form of temptation on the point of appetite. As Bible believers, we need to take a position for righteousness and truth on this subject as well as on all others. The tendency in dietetic reform is to bring us back step by step to God's original design that men should subsist on the natural products of the earth. But some do not understand the true principle of health reform. Their knowledge is partial and their views are distorted. They think that it consists of abandoning the use of injurious articles and subsisting on a diet, which is really meager and insufficient. That goes very much with what you were just saying. There is another class who do not realize the importance of health principles. They have had abundance of opportunities for becoming acquainted with these principles. They understand the necessity of eating and dressing with simplicity in obedience to moral and physical laws, but they do not appreciate the privilege of knowledge and they shrink from the self-denial that a right course involves. I have heard such persons say, I know that I have wrong habits that are injuring my health, but my habits have been formed and it is next thing to impossible to change and do not and do even as well as I know. These persons are working against their own interest and happiness in this life and are disqualifying themselves to obtain the future life. They are enlightened transgressors of natural law. And God is not responsible for the suffering which they bring upon themselves. Such persons will shun duty in other things. By refusing to practice self-denial in these everyday matters, they blunt the conscience. They cannot, they will not be susceptible to the sanctifying influence of Bible truth and of the Spirit of God. And to avoid reproach, they will vol violate God's moral law. How many of us wish it said that we are violating God's moral law? Repeat that, please. For how many of us wish it to be said that we are violating God's moral law? Say none of us will want to say it. 
If we offend in one, have we not offended in all? Yes. And that is, for many, a very hard concept to accept. But it's placed before us as a duty. <clears throat> it is a duty that we have for others that is placed before us by God. If God is giving us this duty, can we then set it aside? If we do so, we do so at our peril. There are many others who are lamentably ignorant of, on health subjects. Among these are not a few whose profession of Christ requires them to be temperate in all things. 1 Corinthians 9.25 There are also educated men who can explore the depths of the earth with the geologist or traverse the heavens with the astronomer, but who take not the slightest interest in the wonderful mechanism of their own bodies. There are yet others who can name and describe the bones and the organs of the human body, but are as ignorant of the laws of health and the cure of disease as if life were controlled by blind fate instead of definite and unvarying laws. Do God's laws change? Not yet. Have God's laws ever changed? Not that I can tell. Does God change? No. If this is indeed the case, then we need to accept that our Heavenly Father, in not changing, is providing us with an example that we need to follow. <clears throat> because the principles of health and temperance are so important and are so often misunderstood, neglected, or unknown, we should educate ourselves that we may not only bring our own lives into harmony with these principles, but teach them to others. The people need to be educated, line upon line, precept upon precept, the matter must be kept fresh before them. Nearly every family needs to be stirred up. The mind must be enlightened and the conscience aroused to the duty of practicing the principle of true reform. These words of admonition are trying to show us how important that the entire gospel, the right arm and the left arm of the gospel, righteousness by faith and the health message are going to be for us to present before the world. We are to be the living epistles, the ones that come before the world as examples of Christ and his righteousness. How many of us are preparing for this today? Ministers especially should become intelligent on this question. As shepherds of the flock, they will be held accountable for willing ignorance and disregard of nature's laws. Let them find out what constitute true hygienic reform and teach its principles, both by precept and by a quiet, constant example. They should not ignore their duty in this matter, nor be turned aside because some may call them extremists. 
at conventions, institutes, and other large and important meetings, instruction should be given upon health and temperance. Bring into service all the talent at command and follow up the work with publications on the subject. Educate, educate, educate should be the watchword. How often are we teaching by our own examples? How Mostly often do we opinionate, reveal? Opinionate, opinionate, not, not educate, educate, educate. Right. That's, that's what I see. I mean, and I'm guilty of it too. If not the worst guy here. At this point, like Paul, I see that I am the least of my brethren. I need to be educated. I need to be shown step by step that which is most necessary. And when I don't understand it, I need to have it explained to me. Who are the ministers that she is writing to? I'd say all of them. Is she not writing to all of us? Yeah. Yeah. And we're all, we're all are ministers. We, yes. Agreed. She spoke more for our time than their, her time, too. Amen. Yeah, and back in um, at that time, there was this divide between the ministers and the medical work, um, which is one of the things that created the problems later with Kellogg, is that so few of the ministers were willing to uh, to follow health reform. Right, and and they saw his work as as unnecessary or as extreme. Yeah, the extreme, um, the extremist comment uh, particularly interested me because that's that's a lot of times what uh, we're accused of. Well, there are people right. who are, there are people who are extreme. So, you agreed, know, and and they do bring a a disservice to health reform. So they have extreme views that aren't supported in the spirit of prophecy. I agree. But here, you know, Ellen White is presenting this balance, right? I mean, you're not going to have a diet that's that's meager and insufficient. Because um, I've seen people, you know, just raw food or things like that, which would not be supported um, by the spirit of prophecy. And, and doctors Agatha and Calvin Thrash you know, had to address those those extremes that they saw uh, at Uchi Pines, people who had suffered health problems because of their extremes in diet. Um, so, so there are true extremes, but we shouldn't call health reform that Ellen White has laid out uh, in, in her councils as extreme, but often it is considered right. extreme. Yes, it right. is. In all health institutions, instruction in regard to the laws of nature should be made a special feature. The principles of hygienic reform should be carefully and thoroughly set before all, both patients and helpers. Conscientious physician will not fail to talk to his patients plainly of the ruinous effects of self-indulgence in eating, in drinking, and dressing, and the overtaxification of their vital forces, things which have destroyed their health. He will not increase the evil by administering drugs till exhausted nature gives up the struggle, and will aid nature in her work of restoration by a wise use of her own simple remedies. Yeah. 
if the physician chooses to increase the evil by administering drugs, are they not walking under the banner of the adversary rather than the banner of Christ? And of course, with uh, um, the, the drug medications, they're often addressing, well, almost always addressing the symptoms and never the cause. And they create more problems. Right. You pile drug upon drug. And, and you see this, uh, especially with people, with the elderly, who are taking so many medications um, that have never been tested together. And one medication causes a problem that they have to take another medication for. Right. And if they just had no medications at all, uh, their health would be much better. Right. It's, that's what it seems like. A great amount well, of good may be great. done. Go ahead, please. Sorry. No, I was just saying it starts with the right diet. Uh, that's all. A, a lady from church who, who passed away at the age of 99 uh, never took drugs, except when she had broken her hip and she ended up in the hospital. Um, she, uh, she was unhappy with the medications that they were giving her. But I believe that she didn't recover because of the medications she was receiving. Mm. A great amount of good may be done by teaching the sick how to prevent suffering and disease in the future by the formation of correct habits. This will often be uphill work and requires moral courage. For while many will be profited by such efforts, others will be offended. But the God-fearing physician or nurse will not shrink from this work. He will seek to lead the mind away from the prevailing and fashionable errors and to reform the practice. One reason why many have become discouraged in practicing health reform is that they have not learned how to cook so that proper food simply prepared would supply the place of the diet to which they have been accustomed. They become disgusted with the poorly prepared dishes. And next we hear them say that they have tried health reform and cannot live that way. Many attempt to follow out meager instruction in health reform and make such sad work that it results in injury to digestion and to discouragement to all concerned in the attempt. If you adopt the reform, you should become good cooks. Those who can avail themselves of the advantages of properly conducted hygienic cooking schools will find it a great benefit, both in their own practice and in teaching others. In all missions, both home and foreign, women of intelligence should have charge of the domestic arrangements. Women who are practical cooks and know how to prepare food palatably and healthfully. The tables should be abundantly supplied with food of the best quality. If any have a perverted taste that craves tea, coffee, condiments, and unhealthful dishes, enlighten them. Seek to arouse the conscience that before them the principles of the Bible upon hygiene. This work will require the most delicate tact, the most thoughtful consideration, the most earnest prayer that heavenly wisdom may be imparted. There are many who try to correct the lives of others by attacking what they regard as wrong habits. They go to those whom they think in error and point out their defects, but do not seek to direct the mind to true principles. Such a course often comes far short of securing the desired results. When we make it evident 
that we are trying to correct others, we too often arouse their combativeness and do more harm than good. And there is a danger to the reprover also. He who takes upon himself to correct others is likely to cultivate a habit of fault finding and soon his whole interest will be in picking flaws and finding defects. Now, we are coming close to the close of our time together today. Are there any other comments, questions, or concerns for what we have been addressing in relation to this message of hygienic reform? Dwight, we've been going over this uh, a little while, haven't we? How many weeks do you think we've been doing this? Hmm? Quite a while. Quite a while. I I don't don't have a direct answer for you. Yeah. Okay. The only reason I ask is I'm just, you know, going back over these things and I have to go into the videos to find out where I'm at, you know, what, what we were presenting each time. No big deal. Yeah, I, I yeah. was thinking like five weeks or something like that so far. Five or six, probably. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This next paragraph is pretty important too, because I think it's one of the oh. the errors that people most often get caught up in. Um, okay. Watch others to pick at their faults or expose their errors. Do not catch hold of isolated ideas and make them a test. Mm. Criticizing others who practice may not agree with your opinion. But we need to study the subject broadly and deeply and seek to bring our own ideas and practices into harmony with the principles of Christian temperance. Educate others to better habits by the power of your own example. If we move from principle in these things, if as Christian reformers we educate our own taste and bring our diet into harmony with the original plan, we shall not only be benefited ourselves, but we shall exert an influence upon others by which God will be pleased and honored. And this is true in almost every area, not just health reform. Um, Not just almost, it is true. Yeah. I mean, uh, and I know with my children, the one thing I always tried to do was be an example, but also not to just criticize and pick at things. If they're doing something that um, is not the best thing that they should be doing, I would just provide something better for them and direct them towards things that are better rather than just criticizing the things that they do, are doing that are wrong. And, and so to redirect people in the principles of health reform is definitely more productive than criticizing or standing in judgment of them condemnation because they don't think the way that you do. Right. Exactly. These are the thoughts that I was led to present at this time. Do we have any other comment or question for us to consider before we close? Shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity that we've had to consider together, to study together these words, these admonitions, so that we may more clearly understand not only the need for the health message, but how very vital righteousness by faith is in the message that is to be given. Help us to examine ourselves more closely. Direct us now. Show us that that you would have us to do. 
We thank you for the light that is behind us, for the path that is before us. We ask, Father, for your guidance and watch care for all that we do this Sabbath day. Be with us, each one that have been in this meeting. Be with those that will examine this later via the internet. May your will be done. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.